This, this is, is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review, a program dedicated to books and research about a broad range of issues pertaining to Israel and beyond. This interview was made possible by the Z3 project, an initiative of the Oshman family JCC, committed to creating an ongoing dynamic forum for opinions and ideas about diaspora Jewry and Israel. The Oshman family JCC is a premier source in the Silicon Valley of exciting and innovative programming focused on architecting the Jewish future. For more information about Z3, visit z3project.org. My guest today is an American-Israeli writer and public intellectual. He's a senior fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem. His best-selling book, Letters to My Palestinian Neighbor, was published by HarperCollins in 2018. Yossi Klein Halevi, hello and welcome to the show. Hi Gilad, thank you for having me. So your book is an attempt to tell the Jewish story to a generic Palestinian neighbor of yours in Jerusalem. And that Jewish story is well known, at least to us Jews, we, for us it's almost self-evident. So did you choose to tell the story in a certain way that would make more impact on a Palestinian reader? It's a very good question. I had several audiences in mind. My primary audience, of course, was my Palestinian neighbor. And there I felt the need to tell the story that would emphasize peoplehood, the centrality of peoplehood, land, sovereignty, and the connection with religion. The reason that I, I focused on peoplehood is because that's precisely what Palestinians, and I would say people throughout the Middle East tend not to understand about Jewish identity. Uh, what you'll hear very often from Palestinians and again Arabs more broadly is we, we Muslims, we have no problem with the Jews as a religion. You lived under Islam happily or let's say, and we are happy for you to live under Islam again but you're not a nation and you artificially reconstructed your identity in the 19th century based on European nationalism. And so I tried to explain what Am Yisrael means, the people of Israel, and how this is an identity that goes back 3,500 years, 4,000 years, and that we see ourselves as a people with a religious identity. And by emphasizing this that the, the nexus between peoplehood and religion, uh, the connection between this people and this religion and a particular land, I try to show how Judaism works a little bit differently than Islam and Christianity, which are universal faiths. Judaism is a particularist faith meant for a particular people. I try to explain the religious logic of that, and how that's played out in our history, how, how peoplehood has played out in my own identity. So that was one audience. The second audience uh, were Jews, ourselves. And I initially thought that I would be writing a book called Letters to Young American Jews, a book with a title nobody would read. <laughs> <laughs> and in the end, I realized that there's no need actually to write that that book, because much of what young American Jews don't understand about Israel, about Jewish identity, is very similar to what uh, Palestinians don't understand about us. And so, so I, I, in the end, I, I wrote just this one book. And it's interesting, Gilad, you know, you were saying that we know this story. And I find that, well, we know this story, or we think we know it, we may not really understand the story. Now, every, everyone will have their own take on what this story means, and this book is, is very much a subjective take on Jewish history, on Jewish identity. But I find that, that the, this, this meeting point between all these different components of our identity is intuitively understood, certainly by Israelis. I, I think by, by American Jews, perhaps less. But not explicitly understood. And I think we need to make this story explicit. And that even goes for, for Zionism. 
And so I'll give you an example of how I, I try to tell the story on Zionism. I define Zionism as the meeting point between need and longing. And the story of the Zionism of need is a 20th century Jewish story. It begins with the Kishinev pogroms and it culminates in the Holocaust. But that's very much a limited story. The story of the longing component of Zionism is a 2,000-year-old story or 4,000-year-old story. And we, by emphasizing the story of the Zionism of need, we do an injustice to the story of the Zionism of longing, this extraordinary story of how the Jewish people managed to keep a kind of vicarious indigenousness with the land that we lost but never forfeited. And then even more extraordinarily to actually pull it off and, and return there. So these are some of the elements that I try to explain. So um, what, what kind of reactions did you expect before they actually came in, you expect the Palestinians uh, to have? Because, you know, you, you, I don't uh, um, rule out a possibility or a scenario whereby a Palestinian would read it and say, okay, I accept all this. You are a people. You, you see yourself as a, like a, like a national collective. But still, it doesn't justify uh, a, a, a Jewish state that would uh, that historically dispossessed my people and right. came at my expense. They could say it just easily, the same, I think. Um, okay, that's fine. Let's all live in one binational state or whatever, where all, all of us can listen to each other, where the narratives meet, etc. So it's a very good question. Uh, in terms of my expectations... I tried very hard not to have any. And that wasn't really difficult because this book, in some sense, uh, almost wasn't published. I had a very hard time finding a publisher for it. And it's it seems like a miracle that the book was published, let alone that it became a bestseller. It's, it's, it still hasn't fully sunk in. So when you ask me what my expectations were, the first hope that I had was simply that the book would be published. And, uh, and in terms of Palestinian responses, I, had, I tried to have no expectations at all. And the reason for that is I, I, I live this conflict. I, I know what we on the Israeli side feel about the other side. And I know I have a sense of what the other side feels about us. And uh, neither side is probably wrong <laughs> in, its, in its negative perception of the other side, at least in terms of its impact on, on their lives. So I, was, um, I put the book out and I just let it go. You know, my, my wife called it a... Um, a, a letter in a bottle thrown over the wall. And uh, the wall, the security barrier, is literally outside of my home at the edge of French Hill in Jerusalem. And so I, that wall is, is, is a metaphor for our relationship. So I didn't know who would respond, if there would be any responses. And I begin the book by saying, Dear neighbor, I call you neighbor because I don't know your name or anything else about you. And that's what that's one of the reasons why I had a hard time selling the book, by the way, because the publishers were saying, find the Palestinian, exchange letters, and then we'll publish the book. Yeah, it's and, a dialogue without an, an interlocutor. Yes. And yeah. my response was that would be artificial. After the second intifada, my connections with the Palestinians stopped. And as a result of that, for me to find the Palestinian, I imagine I could, someone who will exchange letters, it didn't feel truthful to the reality of most Israelis and most Palestinians. We don't have connections anymore. It needed to be more organic. And what I told the publisher was, look, let's put the book out. I will elicit Palestinian responses. I will translate the book into Arabic, put it online for free downloading, which is what we did. The book came out the same day that it came out in English. It came out in Arabic. And I will invite responses. And then the next edition will include an epilogue of, of letters from Palestinian neighbors. And that's exactly what happened. I ended up getting enough quality responses 
which isn't to say people who agreed with me, but letters that were that were written with a a, a tone of reciprocal respect, a tone of engagement, that I could that I could publish a a I think a very powerful collection. Did any of them say, okay, I get all this, but still doesn't justify a Jewish well, state? Well, so what 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 I would say almost all of them either said or would say. Uh, and I've gotten to know almost all of them. We've become friends. We 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 not only exchange letters, but I've had I've had some of them over to my home. They've some have had had me as as a guest, and so there's really a sense of of the beginnings of a relationship. And and what people would say is okay. Let's say the more open or 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 accepting response. Yes, you are indigenous here. You do have a history, uh, but you should have never come back. And my response to that is, of course, I, I understand that. And I would feel the same way if I were Palestinian. But, but we have this history. We acted on the history and we did it. We're here. We succeeded. And we're not giving it up. After waiting 2,000 years, we're actually not going to give this up. And so... When I explain in the book the depth of what this story means to Jews, and especially in a religious context, which is something that most Muslims have no idea about because we've never explained it to them. No one on our side has ever turned to, to the Palestinians or turned to the Arab world and said, this is our story. This is why we're here. You don't have to accept it. You don't have to become a Zionist, but you need to understand our story. And so... What I do get from Palestinians is, ah, we didn't realize the story goes so deeply. And no, you're not going to give up. And so we have to come to terms with this. You, you do say at some, in some places in the book that it was informed by your being a religious man. Yes. Is that what, <clears throat> what you mean by that? That it's really the religious component that was, has been repeatedly downplayed yes. by Israelis in dialoguing with the Palestinians that really uh, uh, fed your inquiry? One of the frustrations that I've had over the years is that the people who are most qualified to conduct a real dialogue with the Palestinians uh, are those who tend to be least interested. And I'm speaking of religious Jews or Jews who come from Arab countries who understandably have this sense of, of deep anger and, and, and this feeling of dispossession. Uh, those who tend to, those Israelis who tend to be most eager for dialogue also tend to be the least suitable. What do you think that is? Well, because... Because they tend to be, let's say, more Western, liberal, uh, yani open, quote, unquote. Uh, but uh, a secular Western cosmopolitan Ashkenazi sensibility does not resonate in the Arab world. One of the most gratifying responses that I've gotten were Palestinians who wrote me saying, and, and I got a few of these letters, saying to the effect that I've never been able to hear your narrative before, but couched in a religious language and speaking as a person of faith, I, I, something touched me. And I was able to at least stick around long enough to read through this. So maybe your book should have been titled Letters to My National Religious Zionist Neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> That's the next yeah, one. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> to, to mobilize these people to engage more, but it's in, yes, more but, seriously with, but, with dialogue. Well, look, the book is coming out uh, in Hebrew, uh, God willing, in a few months. And I'm hoping that that will trigger a whole different kind of conversation among Israelis. Uh, a conversation which... Uh, will, I hope, be, be especially directed toward the center of the map. Because what has happened, as we saw now in the last elections, is that uh, the Israeli left has effectively collapsed. And instead, we have the center emerging, and that's where I position myself and always have. I've been voting for centrist parties since moving to Israel in the early 80s. These small, absurd centrist parties that nobody even remembers. You know, Meimad and Aderach HaShlishit and, and Mifleget HaMerkaz and parties that came and went that lasted one, one term, if that. Uh, and now the center really 
is 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 the main opposition to the right and that that it that thrills me because because uh, i feel that the hope for an eventual conversation an eventual peace conversation between israeli society and palestinian society must come from the mainstream center which is to say people who feel that all the land belongs to us kula shali to use the language of the mishnah just as I've never met a Palestinian who does not believe that all of the land between the river and the sea is at least in principle Palestine, my starting point is the same for my side. It's all mine. But that's my starting point, not my end point. My end point is two peoples, each claiming the entirety of the land, need to share it. Did you have any doubts when deciding to write this book about your identity as an as American-born Because it opens the door to a response saying, "Well, you have somewhere to go. Um, I don't." And it's different to you mean among Israelis? No, among Israeli, Palestinians. Oh, Palestinians yeah. respond. <laughs> um, and that's different to an Israeli, a uh, um, native-born Israeli right. saying the same thing. I mean, I'm here not just because of that history, but also by a virtue of being born here. so i I, I was uh, quite. upfront about my own personal story that's that really in some ways animates the narrative and what I try to explain to my neighbor is that the fact that I happen to be an American born Jew is an accident I could have been born in Poland or Yemen uh, or Iraq uh, or Russia or Ethiopia and this is just how the 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 winds dispersed us and And my returning home is not as an individual. I'm not coming here as someone as an American. I'm not coming here as, as Yossi. I'm coming here as someone who is part of a people that is re-indigenizing itself. And that that for me is really the crucial point here. And, and the reason I believe that peace has been so elusive uh, on the Palestinian and Arab side is because of, of two reasons. One is... The notion of Jewish peoplehood has not been internalized and uh, and two the notion of our deep rootedness in in this land has not been internalized and so the argument that I try to make is that I am part of a people that has repatriated and that is is rerooting itself uh, in this land the thing about the narrative uh, and I think it In, in part derives from the fact that you had these very different audiences in mind when writing it is that it's very centered on the Jewish story I mean that's what it's there for and I was thinking to myself were I a Palestinian reader I would constantly ask myself all right where do I come in it's sort of a take it or leave it kind of thing well what, what what's your take on this so the Palestinian narrative comes in in the new edition of the book and <laughs> the paperback edition uh, which has a 50 page epilogue of Palestinian response do you think it could be incorporated into your no. narrative in any way no 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 no, 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 also, no, no are there no. any meeting points any? no no, 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 no this is this I feel that this is one of the 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 illusions of Of the left that we have to free ourselves from these are two parallel irreconciliable narratives my narrative of 1948 is that this was one of the greatest moments of justice in history the Palestinian narrative is exactly the opposite my narrative of 1967 is this was an act of of self-defense Palestinians this was an act of Israeli aggression and on and on and My hope is if, if there's going to be any convergence at all, it is where, where both sides come to the point where we acknowledge that the tragedy of this conflict is that it is right versus right. It is two indigenous peoples fighting over the same little tortured strip of land. And that's the, the, those are the partners that I'm looking for. And the Palestinian voices that I published in, In, in the latest in the paperback edition of, of letters uh, are voices who affirm more or less not all but most will affirm that uh, that position and I I made a decision to give the Palestinian letter writers the last word in the book 
at my, 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 my initial impulse was, well, I'll publish their letters and then I'll publish my responses. Then I thought, you know, the reader has just sat through 200 pages of my narrative. Let me honor the, the courage and the, the, the good intentions of Palestinians who responded to me by giving them the last word of my book. I spoke recently in uh, Cincinnati. Uh, it was a very powerful experience. The, the Jewish community there adopted the book as a community-wide read and had literally dozens of study groups over the last year. And so I came there to, to speak to the community, and uh, a woman stands up uh, and uh, says, uh, I'm Palestinian, and I've come... With, I came with six pages of questions. I read your book, and I had, I had so much to push back on. But I didn't know that the new edition has an epilogue with Palestinian letters and that you have given the Palestinian narrative the last word. So all of the questions and challenges that I have to you uh, are actually now irrelevant. And I'm looking very much forward to reading the epilogue. And that, for me, was such a touching moment of realizing, you know, just all, it doesn't take a lot. Respect the other side. Listen. Honor, honor their narrative as painful as it is for us. And it's very painful for me. It is not my narrative. And, and, and if I'm asking Palestinians to listen to my narrative, I'd better be ready to listen to theirs. Has there been, broadly speaking, um, difference between the responses that you got from Palestinians in Palestine and the Palestinian diaspora? It's a great question. Uh, yes, yes. I have gotten more positive responses from the Palestinian diaspora, though by no means uh, a majority. But certainly Palestinians who, who, who know Jews and I'm speaking specifically of, of the American Palestinian diaspora, uh, tend to be a little more nuanced, a little more open. Uh, certainly, I, don't, I, I wouldn't get letters from Palestinians in, the, in America saying the Holocaust didn't happen, you exaggerate, you're lying. And I got those letters from Palestinians, you know, the West Bank. And, and, um, and so uh, there is a difference. I've gotten... I'm getting increasing numbers of letters from around the Arab world. Are they still coming? Still, oh, yeah. I have a website in both uh, English and Arabic, uh, letterstomyneighbor.com, and people are invited to go in. And, and the, in the English website, many of these letters have been translated, and I have a young Palestinian uh, who does that and uh, who also reaches out to Arab social media. And the letters, some of the letters are just so moving. I got a letter from a Saudi sheikh saying, I didn't realize that uh, the Hebrews are the Jews. It's you guys. You belong here. You're part of this region. And the, the kinds of things we take for granted uh, are not at all uh, what, what, uh, what the Middle East actually knows about us. Is there or has there ever been a Palestinian Yossi Klein Halevi making a similar attempt to explain the Palestinian story? I mean, I, while reading your book, I've often thought about Edward Said, whose life mission as a political activist, apart from being an academic, was to tell the Palestinian story in the West at a time when it was virtually unknown. Uh, and he also did it very well. Um, do you accept the analogy or is it offensive to you? Oh, no, that's not offensive at all. Um, I, look, he, he approached it in a, in a different way. I, I, I do write about history, but I'm writing more uh, from a very personal perspective. I would say a more, uh, a closer uh, analogy might be the Palestinian nonfiction writer Raja Shahada, uh, who writes very powerfully about the experience of living under occupation. Uh, the first book of, uh, uh, that exposed me to the Palestinian narrative was his. Uh, it was called Sumud, and I read it in the, in the 1980s, shortly after I moved to Israel. And it really helped shape my, let's say, emotional understanding. 
And in the end, that's what I'm trying to do as much as a as an intellectual exercise here. I'm trying to to convey something of the experience of living inside this story and what it means to live the Jewish story, the Israeli story, uh, and and have a very thin filter between your personal identity and your collective identity, and sometimes no filter at all. It might sound like a daft question, and it probably is, but was it worth it? Did it make you more hopeful? Did it help you reach out to people that you never thought you would? So, Gilad, let me give you an Israeli answer. Whether it made me more hopeful or not is, is, is in some sense irrelevant. Because, uh, as you well know, the way that we cope in Israel is one day at a time. Is peace more likely to break out than war in the next year? I would argue not. I think that the odds are that we are looking at a major conflict in the coming months. Um, certainly uh, well before peace breaks out. Do I think that there are people on the other side who are ready to have a conversation with us about our legitimacy? Yes, absolutely. And in that sense, this book really is an experiment. I put this out. I invited responses. And the experiment, I can say, even I, I can't say categorically the experiment has succeeded because I don't know what that means. But it hasn't failed. I have found partners. I've found partners who are ready to appear with me on college campuses. I've done tours with Palestinians who wrote me letters. Very, that's a very powerful experience. These are people who I didn't know a year ago and today are my friends. It has given me a, a, the experience has reinforced my, my, understanding of the uh, the pasuk, the verse in, uh, in the Torah, bakesh shalom verotfehu, seek peace and pursue it. And the word verotfehu, pursue it, is very strange. It's redundant. Seek peace and pursue it. And my understanding in the context of our conflict is seek peace when it's possible, pursue it when it's not possible. And it's not possible now. And I am trying to simply model a conversation. I'm not going to bring peace. I'm just a writer. I'm not a politician. And even if I were a politician, I don't believe peace is possible right now. The conditions aren't right for many reasons. But the Torah makes it clear that peace is such a, an ultimate value. And it's not a left-wing value. It's a Jewish value. Peace is as much a value and an interest for me as a centrist Israeli as it is for a left-wing Israeli. And so I may have a different approach to making peace, a different understanding. Uh, I don't feel guilty for the occupation. I believe we tried in the past to end the occupation. I believe the Palestinian leadership wouldn't accept the two-state solution even if the left-wing merits were in power in Israel today. But that doesn't absolve us. So that's why I say that that it's not a question of optimism or pessimism. It's a question of, of responsibility, maybe even of religious obligation. And as a religious Jew, I, 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 feel, I feel the command of, of a mitzvah, and it is a mitzvah to pursue peace. Yossi Klein Halevi, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me, Gilad. And many thanks to Gizem Ozdemir, our sound engineer, to Itai Shalem, our producer, as well as Amitai Freiman, the director of the Z3 project. And now we've got a request. Many or most of you listen to us on the Apple Podcasts app and we would like to ask you to please consider writing us a review. All you have to do is launch the app, select our podcast in the library section, scroll down to ratings and review, and then press write a review and, of course, write one. You can also support us by going to our website, that's tlv1.fm slash review, and subscribing onto our Patreon campaign, Every Little Helps. Check out our archive, it has more than 500 interviews. If you like what we do here, you can also follow us on Facebook. Our page is called the Tel Aviv Review Podcast, Ideas from Israel. Join us again next week for another edition of the Tel Aviv Review, and until then, goodbye. <laughs>